Yeah, despite my, um, my obvious um, Missouri provenance, I talk like my ex-governor used to do. <laughs> well, he still does talk like I do, but he's not our governor anymore. Uh, so in, in 20 minutes, I'll try to give you a very, com uh, very uh, condensed view of um, the modern science of, of consciousness. First of all, what does consciousness refer to? It refers to states that we all have about the experience. Right? It all feels like something to have pain, to be in pleasure, to have pleasure, to see blue, just to feel anything, whether it's a very complicated feeling or very emotional feeling, like being happy or sad or angry or just seeing something. And, and the puzzle that science has um, uh, tried to grapple with over the last 2,300 years, at least since the ancient Greeks, is how does consciousness come into the world? It's, it's really a puzzle. If you look at the equations of physics, and I'm going to present you many, many equations for your pleasure. We'll, w we'll go through them the first 20 minutes. The, the, the equations of physics, or if you, look at the, um, if you look at the periodic table, or um, if you look at the periodic table, or you look at the endless ATGC chat in our genes, it doesn't say anything anywhere about consciousness. Yet we find ourselves in a world where we are conscious. We have these experiences. Not all the time. So when you're sleeping, uh, particularly when you're in a so-called deep sleep, a non-REM sleep, you don't have any experiences. When you're an, um, um, under anesthesia during an operation, you also don't have any experiences. And even during the day, you find yourself doing many, many things. Um, where you don't have any experience whatsoever. You find yourself in the act of doing things that you're only in hindsight conscious of, or maybe never when you're driving down a road and you're, you know, <laughs> you're texting or something, you have, which is a really bad idea, but if you do it, <laughs> if you do it anyhow, you can see that you can drive, you know, without really being in the act because you're concentrated on, on, the, on the texting. So that raises the question, how can, you how can your body process all that information without it giving rise to consciousness? So... Is there a way we can just darken this light just for the first, um, because people ask me, if we can just turn off this light, it's just, I'm going to show you one illusion, because scientists love to define things, and it's very difficult to define things, particularly when it comes to consciousness. But if you just bear with me, if you just look at um, the, the little cross there, just fixate the little cross, right? Don't move your eyes. Do not move your eyes. Keep your eyes as steady as you can on that little white fixation. The one at the bottom, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it works better if you do it at the one at the bottom. Now, what you should see, what, what do you see? Yeah. Yeah, so what happens, so you should all see the blue sphere, right? Otherwise, you should come see me afterwards. In addition, you see these two very salient yellow squares. And what's remarkable, one or sometimes both of those yellow sal uh, uh, salient squares will disappear. Right? And so they're physically still present on the display. The, the, the photons still strike your eyes, but you're not conscious of them. This is a very simple form of consciousness. It's visual consciousness. It's a conscious sensation for yellow. And the claim is that once we understand the, the, the basis of, of what it gives rise to the feeling of seeing yellow, we probably have understood most of consciousness because the highly elaborate forms of consciousness that we love, like self-consciousness, the fact that I know I'm a man, the fact that I know I'm going to die, all those sorts of things, they're probably just evolutionary elaborations upon this uh, very simple form of consciousness that we probably share with, all, with many, if not all, creatures. And this is also an illusion that we can manipulate very easy in the lab, and we can put you in a magnet. If you come to my lab at Caltech, I can put you in a magnet, and I can... I can make you watch this, and I can look at the part of your brain. Where's the part of your brain that only responds when you see it, but that doesn't respond when you don't see it? Right? This is one way to identify the footprints of consciousness. Because I can track in your eyes, the, eye, the, the nerve cells in the eye will always respond to the yellow. But somewhere in the catacombs of the brain, there are going to be neurons that only fire when you consciously see it. And those neurons have a very intimate relationship with consciousness, and those we're interested in tracking and manipulating. So this is the ancient mind-body problem, as um, Aristotle already conceived of it. Of course, he thought it was in the heart. Today, we think we know, we know better. It's in the brain. So this is my brain. It's a very elongated egghead brain. <laughs> and um, it is actually extremely elongated. And you can see sort of what I painted on top of. It's just three different views of a brain. You've seen many of these brains. And th uh, this shows selectively the part of the brain that's active when, when I see color. And this sort of epitomizes the mind-body problem because we have two points of view. 
We have the point of view of me, the experiencing, the experiencing subject. It's called the first person point of view. I, I'm a subject, just like you are a subject, and I have experiences. I see red, or I have a, you know, toothache, or I'm in love, or I, you know, I, I agonize about something. Those are four different conscious states. That's the first person perspective. And then we also have the third person perspective of an outside. So here I can look at the brain and I can see, well, if, if this person, namely me, is, claims he sees, con he sees something red, and this part of the brain is active. And when he, see, when he smells something or when he's in love or whatever, this other part of the brain is active. So now I can try to further sort of pinpoint what is it about these neurons in that part of the brain that give rise to conscious sensation of blue or being in love or, or being angry. So that's sort of a, a modern research uh, paradigm that many, many labs are, are doing, putting people into specific conscious states and then putting them in magnets or using other techniques to look at the parts of the brain that are active when, when, when people have conscious experiences. <coughs> now, at, th at this point, it's important to distinguish the two forms of, of consciousness. And sort of you can think of them like transitive verbs or non-transitive verbs. There's a usage of states of consciousness. So hopefully I haven't put anybody asleep yet because that's one, fo that's one state of consciousness, uh, deep sleep. Another state of consciousness is REM sleep, so-called rapid eye movement sleep, when we tend to experience um, hallucinations that we call dreams. Another form of con um, another state of consciousness is the one we are all in right now, that you are relatively aroused and you have different forms of conscious experience. In fact, you probably all, always, ha when you're awake, you probably always have a conscious experience, except possible under certain states of, of deep meditation. And, and um, these states of consciousness can sometimes be profoundly disturbed. You might remember uh, Terry Schiavo. Do you remember her five years ago? So there are many patients like her. There are roughly um, 20,000 patients like this, 20 to 30,000 patients like her today in the U.S. alone that are so-called in a persistent vegetative state, PVS. So they are the, uh, due to various traumatic brain injury or t um, in her case her heart stood still for, for 15 minutes, anoxia. So uh, part of the brain got damaged due to a lack of oxygen. The, the cortex itself is damaged, so her EG was flat, but the brain stem that maintains life is still intact. And these people sort of, they're alive, they're clearly alive. You can see this patient like Terry Schiavo, they have a sleep, they sleep with eye closed and they can open their eyes for eight or 10 hours, they're aroused. Sometimes they track, sometimes they, they sort of grimace or they, they, it looks like a smile. But as far as we can tell, it's, it's all sort of bra it's reflexes, brainstem reflexes. So occasionally if you have a very bright light, the patient will very briefly follow. But, but typically, for example, if you, if you ask the patient, move your eyes to the left or apply pressure or something, the patient's unable to do that. So there's no way to communicate with her. And it seems all very simple reflexes. And that's, we understand that because there's still the brainstem that's intact. But of course, if you're an external observer, you know, you're the mother or the father, and you're sitting there day, day in, day out, and you just film, you know, the five seconds when she looks like she's following something, and you put it on the web, you know, of course, that gives a very biased view. And yeah, so these are all states of consciousness, and, and medical science is very interested in trying to understand uh, what goes on in these pathologies like coma or persistent vegetative state or minimal conscious state. So, th so, so there are some mechanisms in your brain that need to be functioning for you to be conscious at all. Then there is the other usage of, consci of consciousness wh which relates to content of consciousness. That right now, your content of consciousness should be filled with my voice. Or maybe you have a pain in your, in your, in your big toe, so you should be conscious of the, the pain in your big toe, or you're remembering some event that happened today, you're conscious of something else. And what science is really interested in, what is it, again, once again, because there's a non sequitur, we, we, there's sort of this explanatory gap. We understand about neurons. So we understand that if I have toothache, there, there's neural activity that, gives ri that, that's, that originates in the pulp of my tooth that goes along the tri trigeminal nerve that ultimately gives rise to neural activity in, my, in a particular part of my cerebral cortex. But what we don't yet understand, why this activity in the cerebral cortex, why do I experience it? Why do I experience anything at all? That's a mystery. For example, I mean, I can ask you a question. Do you think this guy, right? Many of you will have things like this, or they have Macs or PCs or something. Do you, do you believe that if, 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 if these machines are in a particular state that they experience something? Well, most of the vast majority of us would say, no, this is just a piece of silicon slab. Well, you could say this is just a piece of meat, but, but except for the observation that we all have that it experiences something. And this, this is the gap that right now we're trying to explain. What, what is it that we know for certain about consciousness? We know a lot. 
So minimal consciousness is associated with certain types of networks, biological networks, but not all. There's, there are several networks that you all have that have no conscious experience. One is, for example, your immune system. Particularly in this room, there are lots of people, lots of crowd, uh, you know, lots of people at close distances, so, you know, there are all these viruses in the air, right? And our immune system, by and large, fights them off very effectively. But it does it silently. There's no, we don't have any feelings. We don't have any subjective experience of our immune system. I don't feel, oh, yeah, right now, you know, there's some, a bunch of white blood cells over here that, that are fighting off some, some, some virus or bacteria. I, I don't have any experience of that. Why is that? We don't know. There's another nervous system called the enteric nervous system, the gut. In the gut, you might have heard about it, the second, um, the second brain. It, it's, you know, roughly 100 million neurons. That's a lot of neurons, as many as your favorite pet has, for example, your dog. Yet, by and large, we don't experience things down here. If we do, which is usually bad news, it's because <laughs> there's, a nerve called uh, the, the, there's a nerve called vagus nerve that mediates that, um, the, the, the sensation up here, and it's, it's here we experience. We don't have any experiences. This nervous tissue here doesn't seem to have generate any experiences. Why? We don't know. We know consciousness doesn't require behavior because we know it happens in all of us. Tonight we're going to close our eyes. We're going to be paralyzed, right? Everything except the breathing muscle. This is central atonia because otherwise you would act out your dream, which is bad. So we'll be paralyzed and we have vivid experiences, right? We fly, we make love. There are all sorts of things that happen. But, but we, we don't move, right? So we also know this from the clinic. There are many cases of... Um, of catachronic behaviors where patients are unable to move, certain types of drug patients, for instance, MPT patients that are unable to move yet have vivid conscious experience. So we know you don't need to move in order to have conscious experiences. We know from patients, from kids, from soldiers that come back from Iraq, they have lost part of their prefrontal um, cortex due to an explosion. They're totally flat. They have no effect whatsoever. They don't care about the fact that, you know, that their limbs are gone, that their life has changed fundamentally. They talk to you totally flat level. So they, they've lost the neural substrate that, that gives rise to emotion, yet they're clearly conscious. They can clearly talk about their experiences. So we know it, it, it con uh, consciousness does not really require emotion. We know consciousness doesn't require long-term memory. There are many patients that have lost, co lost long-term memory due to Alzheimer's or stroke, yet they're clearly conscious. They clearly have states of for some pain or something. Uh, we know that this was disputed for a long time by, by philosophers, but it's now widely accepted. We don't require language to be or self-consciousness. Self-consciousness is just one aspect of consciousness that we humans, particular treasure, particular the literary classes, uh, the people who write books or who write the New York Review of Books, they like because they constantly, you know, you constantly think about yourself. It's probably not such a good idea. <laughs> you constantly think about yourself and so you think sort of, uh, you know, the, the highest form of consciousness is self-consciousness, being aware of yourself. But when you are out there, when you climb, right, when you are on, on, a, on a dangerous climb, when you're weaving at high speed through the traffic, right, you're all out there. You're fully conscious of the world around you. You're very little conscious of, of yourself because you don't have enough attention resources to dedicate to think about yourself because otherwise you're going to have an accident or be dead. We also assume that babies are conscious. Of course, they're prelingual individuals. Or we also assume that patients, you know, if you have an elder patient who had a stroke in the left brain, that the patient might be unable to talk. He's a aphasic. But we assume that he's still, oh, you can in still interact with him me uh, meaningful, telling us that you don't need language to be conscious. And we know from split brain experiment that consciousness can occur in one hemisphere. So we know in principle either the left speaking hemisphere or the right one are sufficient to give rise to consciousness. And most interesting for us, we know that if you lose a particular part of your brain, Oliver Sacks, a neurologist, has, has talked about this, right? He's all the, he describes all these patients that have a loss, a stroke, a gunshot or something, wh where they lose particular parts of, a, of, of their brain, and they lose very specific aspects of consciousness. So, for example, they're unable to recognize their, lo their wife because they can't recognize fa uh, faces anymore. They can see the eyes, they can see the nose and the ears, but they're unable to put it together to conscious percept of a face. Why? Because they lost... The neurons in the brain, we know the neurons in the brain that are dedicated to processing faces, that put all the information together and that somehow give rise to the conscious perception of a face. Or if you lose part of the neurons in your brain, the ones I showed you before, that mediate color, then you're unable to see color. So we know this destruction of small pieces of brain give, uh, give rise to loss of, of conscious sensation associated with that. So we know there's a very tight relationship between my brain and consciousness in particular aspects of my brain in particular aspects of consciousness. And that's what scientists over the last 20 years are trying to, to explore in detail the exact relationship between the two. So there are lots of um, questions that we're looking in the lab and in the clinic that have 
very much relevant to daily life. For example, it's a preterm uh, baby. What, what point does consciousness set in in these preterm babies? Or what point does consciousness set in in a, in a fetus or in a, in a little baby? Right? Does, is it at birth or is it, you know, is it after birth? And of course, the different stages of consciousness. Consciousness in animals. Most biologists assume that these guys, this is a kitchen central in my home, um, that these guys are conscious. Now, why do we say that? Well, in general, we say that for, for, for three reasons. A, the behavior is similar. You know, it's not identical, right? My dog can't tell me directly with, with word he's in pain, but my baby can't tell me either with words that he's in pain, and you know when your baby's in pain. Same thing, you know when your dog's in pain, he comes to you, he limps, he, you know, he vocalizes, he hides under the table, right? So the behavior is, is, is similar, but not identical. Most importantly, the brains are very similar. You know, our brain is bigger, but of course we don't have the biggest brain. That's dolphins and blue whales and, and other elephants, other creatures. And if I give you a little cubic, a little sugar cube of monkey brain or dog brain or human brain, nobody but a few, you know, expert neuroanatomists can tell the difference. The basic substance is really the same. The, n the nerves, the basic hardware of the brain is, is very, very similar across all mammals. What changes is really sort of certain dimensions. And of course, evolutionary, we, we're all closely related. We can see that in the, in the gene atlases that, that we produce at the Allen Brain Atlas. So for all these reasons, it really would boggle the mind if, if it would be mi um, mind-boggling if we had this thing called consciousness, and we would, although we have the same hardware, very similar behavior, very similar genes, very similar receptors, that only we, only we have it, but, but other animals don't. The main thing that we have going for us, we have this highly developed self-conscious, so we can introspect. My dog doesn't sit there and wonders, hmm, where's the difference between me and a human, or am I going to get be fed next week, right? My dog is very much, it's like a, in fact, it's a little bit like a Buddhist. My, my dog is very much in the here and now. My dog, you know, <laughs> no, I think dogs can teach us a lot about that. Dogs are in the here and now. Most animals, except maybe the most highly developed um, great apes, are in the here and now. They don't have this sort of, they don't project themselves into the past and futures we do. But otherwise, it's, it's, it's very similar. So it means we can also look at two animals and, and, and to our animal friends and investigate there to try to understand better the neural basis of, um, of consciousness. And so I, I worked w uh, many years with Francis Crick, the discoverer of, um, the d of the double helical structure of DNA on these questions. And, and we advocated sort of as the standard research strategy now, which is to look for the neural correlates of consciousness. Where we, we're interested, and people are now interested, what are the specific molecular, synaptic, neuronal mechanisms that give rise to specific c conscious sensation? You know, where does the conscious sensation of seeing a dog come about? What are the neurons? Can I manipulate individual neurons to understand, you know, why, did, why is this person of a dog rather than a cat, or why is it painful rather than pleasurable? Can I put a microelectrode, for example, inside the pa um, a brain of a patient doing neuro a neurosurgery to try to, like in matrix, to try to generate such a percept? And the answer is yes. So you, you, you can generate a percept. You can, you can give people feedback on their own neuron firing. I've done that in the clinic where people can sort of experience their own brain states directly. So you can do a lot of interesting stuff there. So it turns out most of the brain does not relate to conscious experiences. So it's interesting, um, at, as, a, as an adolescent at, uh, in my first year at, at um, university, I totally rejected the idea of any unconscious pausing. You know, I started to read Freud, and I thought, well, a bunch of baloney. You know, this argument that there's someone inside my head that's not me and that, that, makes, you know, that makes me do things or makes me act out certain things, just total baloney. Now, sort of uh, 35 years later, it's almost the opposite. Now, because, we, you know, I've read and we know so much about research that most of the stuff we all do, most of the time, we don't know why we do it. We do it, we have, you know, w you have very strong feelings about, for example, when you're in love or when you, you know, when, 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 there are other, when there are strong traumatic events in your life, you have very strong positive and negative feelings, but you, have, you don't really know where they come from. They're there, they present to you very immediate, and you're struggling to try to understand where they come from. Well, that's because pa those parts of the brain that generate those feelings are not accessible to consciousness. Most of the things you do when you pick up something, when you run along a busy street, when you bike, when you climb, when you, when you drive, you're doing a lot of complicated things, but you don't have access to the underlying structures. You only have access to the final possible thing. That's a wonderful, it's a thing with like a wonderful interf interface. We see this world around us, but hidden below that are many, many layers of processing that are all done by our brain, and we really only have access to a very slim uh, uh, um, part of the, of the brain that generates all these conscious sensations. But most of what we do, we do without having access to. 
So this is one technique how we try to get at that unconscious. You know, so Freud and, and, and Nietzsche, I guess, was the first philosopher in Western tradition. Then Sigmund Freud, the first sort of um, from a medical point of view, popularized the notion of this unconscious. Today, you, we can study it. You don't go to a psychoanalyst and pay, you know, 200 bucks per hour. You give undergrads $10 an hour. You put them inside a magnet, and then you do the following thing. So, for example, you project different images. It's what magicians do, but we can do it much better control, although less sexy. So, for example, with your left eye, you see an image of this angry face. It's a, it's a very, it's a um, behaviorally very important stimulus. You know, I want to know in the, in the, whether there's an angry person outside of there. In the right face, in the right eye, you project these constantly changing series of, of color patches. Now, what you'll see for many, many seconds, two to three minutes, in fact, you only see the right, the right patch, although your left eye is still open. So, with your left eye, you're projecting various images, an angry face or a nude, uh, a nude body, all sorts of things that people have done. But you don't see it. Why? Because it's gray. It doesn't change. It's always at the same location while these other things are colorful and they constantly change. But you have both eyes open, right? And if you close your right eye, you can immediately see the angry face. So this allows us, sub rosa, this allows us to sneak in information sort of under the pale of consciousness into your visual system. And we can now probe using fMRI or EEG or other techniques we can probe using functional brain imaging what part of your brain responds to unconscious information. And there's the huge research uh, part now of, uh, of cognitive psychology. So for example, here's one study. They've done this with, un with nude images. And you have a lot of fun. You can put in nude images in males and females and uh, see how they respond. You can check whether they're homosexual or heterosexual. And they sort of, you know, the, the brain responds as you might imagine. So in a, in a Although this image is invisible, you can see that people still pay attention to it. You, you can check this using sophisticated uh, uh, tests. So a heterosexual male will pay attention to invisible pictures of nude females, but will be slightly repelled by invisible pictures of um, naked males. And, and you know, homosexuals appropriate and, and, and females and males appropriate. So, so this is just one technique how you can probe the unconscious now in a much more rigorous scientific way than, than Sigmund Freud ever could because his only technique was, um, you know, talking to people. Now, lastly, the, the most fundamental question, in fact, one of the most fundamental questions that science can ask is why a certain system conscious at all, right? Not functionally, I mean, uh, so that's one question. What, what function does consciousness convey? It's, it's a very heatedly debated question, but more fundamentally, um, how is it, I guess, in Aristotelian language, how is it that certain systems, and I mean this thing inside here, this three-pound brain, gray matter, exudes this, these conscious experiences? And is it the only system in the, in the world that exudes consciousness? Well, A, it's not, because all of you also have brains, and you all ex have a conscious experience. And as I was arguing before, it's not only us, it's also dogs and cats and monkeys and mice, and possibly almost all animals. We don't know whether it's a Rubicon. We don't know whether it's a magic limit where you can say, well, for sure, these animals are pure automata, and these animals above uh, have some conscious experience. We don't know that right now. Uh, we'd like to have a, f a, a theory that tells us, not just based on our intuition, because our intuitions are very often wrong. I mean, our intuition says the Earth is flat and the whale is a fish. And we know both intuitions are wrong. So, so we, we, we'd like to have a fundamental theory that tells us what systems, what gives rise to consciousness. And the only s a, a theory I've ever seen that's remotely convincing to me is a theory that, that's based ultimately on, not on the evolutionary her the heritage. So you can say, well, these guys are not conscious, clearly because they're not evolved. They're silicon, they're made, right? They're silicon. So A, so a you could say the difference is in the hardware. This is, you know, bilipid membranes and, you know, biological squishy stuff in meat, and this is silicon, but we, it's really unclear why, what's magic about, you know, meat and, and synapses and bilipid membranes that's not contained in here. Or you could say it's evolutionary, you know, the evolutionary history of these things is radical different than the evolutionary history of this. It's also unclear why that should make the difference. So fi finally, most people who think about this deeply argue that it has to do with the complexity that inherent to any form of complex system, and complexity needs to be defined in, in a rigorous mathematical term, inherent in any complex system is a little modicum of experience. And this is really a very old theory. It goes back to pan, panpsychism. If you can trace, uh, trace back origin to Asian Greek and to, to Buddhist thought, that, that really consciousness pervades the cosmos, 
And most things have some modicum, some little itty bits of consciousness. And if you have a very complex system like a human brain, you have a lot more than if you have a less complex system like a, like a dog brain, which w weighs only 20 as much as we do, or like a bee brain, which, mays, uh, which weighs uh, roughly 2,000 times less or, or 10,000 times less. But th there's sort of this gradation of, con of, of consciousness in the, in the world. And then you can try to have um, um, a mathematical calculus that, that, that um, this is not my own work, this is the work of Giulio Tononi. You can try to develop a, a, a mathematical calculus based on information theory that sort of ultimately quantifies how much consciousness and the character of conscious experience of each such system. And of course then as engineer, so I'm a professor of biology and engineering, you're ultimately also confronted with a question, well, so you can compute this number, it's called phi. So phi is an attempt to characterize the complexity of an organ, of any organism, of any system, of any system of functional parts, uh, whether it's a brain or something else, and tries to classify them. And so you can look at a, a mouse brain and try to classify its amount of consciousness. You can take the wiring diagram of one of the best studied biological organisms, that's this little guy called C. elegans, a little roundworm, and we understand it has 302 neurons, and we understand, I mean, we scientists understand it very well, you can understand, you can try to measure consciousness inherent in a little bee or in a, in a great ape or in a, in a human brain. But of course, what's magical, you can also try to uh, characterize the complexity of a little romba, of an iPhone, or of the most complex artifact that we've ever built, which is the internet. It's the internet as of three years ago, which contains a billion uh, computers, each of which has, you know, between 100 million and a billion transistors. So that begins this structure, the internet begins to rival uh, in complexity our own individual brains. And so we can wonder, can we at some point, you know, construct artificial, are there already artificial conscious uh, creatures out there or can we construct, can we construct them? So I gave you the view from 30, th well, from 100,000 feet of this new science of consciousness, so which is, you know, very avidly pursued by many, many labs, now both in the clinic to try to help people who have this pathologies of consciousness as well as in labs, in, in humans, in normal, in normal people, normal of course meaning undergraduate students, um, as well as in animals, as well as uh, engineers that are beginning to think about this question in terms of um, uh, machine consciousness. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so have you defined consciousness? I mean, if I'm going to ask the question, is my um, iPhone or the, is the internet conscious, what question am I going to ask of it? You talked about complexity being measured mathematically. Is consciousness measurable mathematically? What's consciousness? So science usually proceeds in the absence of precise definition. You might have read a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine at Caltech redefined what planets are, right? We grew up with the definition of planets including Pluto and then suddenly they were redefined and Pluto is not a planet anymore. So as a provisional working definition people have adopted for consciousness is when you have, a, uh, when you have an experience, when you have a conscious experience, let's say visual experience. When I showed you that illusion I'm not sure you could see from back there. Sometimes you can see the yellow square, sometimes it's not. Well the difference is there in one state you have a c you, you're conscious of yellow, in the other case you're not conscious of yellow. So it's just a pragmatic definition. In the fullness of time, just like with DNA and with elementary particles and with planets, we'll have a rigorous definition that's, that's, uh, that's consistent with all the facts. But right now it's a good enough definition to do experiments and we'll refine it as time goes on. Question from the back room is, in your view, is research on consciousness progressing at a linear or logarithmic pace? Do you expect surprising discoveries in the next decade? It's a supralinear um, exponential pace, I'd say, it's certainly not log. Yes, we, we'll expect, like always in science, we expect uh, things that we didn't, uh, the only thing we see for certain, there'll be unexpected discoveries, and that's true for, for, for the entire history of science. And right now it's speeding up because uh, just the, we have these fantastic tools that let us peer into the human and the animal brain. Uh, when I learned to drive, uh, I had to think very hard about what I'm doing. Now I just do it. It, it, it just does it, it drives. Yes. Did this now move down from the upper brain to the brain stem, or is it still happening up to the same place, just I don't notice it anymore? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So we do think there are different structures involved, not necessarily br the brain stem, but, but, but uh, the idea is that when, you, when you're learning something new, like learning how to drive or to 
you know, and any other skill, that your entire cortex, a large part of your cortex has to be involved. You have to attend, you have to concentrate, you've got to remember. Then you do it often enough, it becomes automatic, then a different part of the brain called the basal ganglia is involved. That's not necessarily brainstem, it's somewhere in between. That's involved in repetitive routine actions like driving, playing tennis, anything else, sword fighting, if you, you, know, if you happen to be a sword fighter and you've done it for 10 years. Yeah, so a different part of the brain literally takes over and then you do it unconsciously. And then if you think about it, then, it inter then uh, you, uh, your performance suffers. So, you know, um, 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 athletes and trainers always emphasize, uh, emphasize that once you've trained something, you should just do it. You should just go out and do it. And if you interrupt it, think, how do I hold my racket when you do a backhand? Then your performance will suffer. Because now you're involved, suddenly involving a different part of the brain again. Is a person conscious if he or she is able to drive a vehicle while in a blackout? I don't know about alcohol-induced blackout, but I do know there are certifiable cases of epileptic seizures and sleepwalkers. So sleepwalkers are a very funny state. In sleepwalking, usually most people sleepwalk, um, it ends with puberty for most, but some people sleepwalk even when they're dull. There are known cases when people drive when the sleepwalking, so as we know from Shakespeare, Macbeth, when you, when you s sleepwalk, you are, the eyes are actually open. So it turns out, it's a f w once you're an adult and you l know how to s uh, drive, it's something done fairly automatically, and you can probably do it when you sleep, when you are, when you are, um, when you sleep drunk. So I don't know about drunkenness per se. I wouldn't try it though. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good for your health. PSA, I like it. All right, we're gonna go to this back room right here. I understand the utility of uh, correlating the substrate activity of the brain with, uh, I guess, reports of conscious experience, how that's useful. But I don't see how that addresses uh, what activity either in the micro or macro level might manifest itself in conscious experience. For example, yes, you could stimulate the brain as Penfield did 40 years ago to get certain conscious experiences, but that stimulation at a neuronal level certainly doesn't explain what's going on. And yes, we could track now pretty complex activity in neuronal nets, but it's not clear to me that that captures what consciousness really is either. So if you could speak to that. Well, it's really a promissory note. I don't want to be held up by the eternal, internal debates of philosophy of what consciousness is and how do you define it. Because we know we've not made uh, any significant progress uh, over the last 2,300 years just by sitting around and debating things. So I think the strategy, is, it's a promissory note admittedly, but it's worked spectacularly well anything, anywhere else in science. We do experiments, we try to do the best to understand the mechanical, mechanistic, you know, electrophysiological basis of consciousness and then hope, just like with DNA or with astronomy, then the fullness of time out of that, a science uh, will emerge and a complete fi a reductionist understanding or holistic understanding of consciousness will emerge. Right now, many people say, well, I can't imagine it. But people made the same objection 100 years ago when they said, I cannot imagine how chemistry can do life. We know chemistry. I know chemistry cannot uh, store all the information that makes up in, 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 in an individual. So I need a new force. I need elan vital, right? I need a vitalism. And then it turned out good old uh, fashion science could perfectly well explain the difference between the living and the, the, the non-living, between the anorganic and inorganic. So I submit a similar approach will also work with consciousness. It might not, but it's our best bet. It's the only game really we have in town right now. All right, Christoph, pick another one, please. We're alternating between the written questions and the asked questions. Even if an iPhone or the internet were conscious, how would we know? Well, remember Hal? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, again, it's a very good question. So one is we might know if at some point, now this is pure speculation, but at some point the, the, if the internet at some point does become conscious, and I don't see right now a way to exclude that. It might have very strange idiosyncratic behavior that you can only understand once you analyze it holistically with all of its 10 to the 9 components. Right? It just might do some very funny things that we say, well, self-organized behavior or something that we tend to associate with creatures who have, who have consciousness. 
The other way of knowing is if you have a theory and you test the theory in people and you test it in, in, in patients, you test it in animals, and then the same theory you apply to iPhones, and this theory might say, well, if certain types of complexities there and certain types of behavior there, in all these other examples that most of us agree with, we think it's conscious, and therefore, by inference, we also think um, uh, an iPhone is conscious. I, may, I, may, um, I mentioned this before, right? A way, we think of, you know, if you ask a kid, a whale is a fish, right? But then I can give you all sorts of reasons why a, a whale is actually a mammal, and most people will say, yeah, that makes sense. A mammal is, is uh, I mean, a whale is a mammal, it's not a fish. So b by similar reason of deductive, chain of deductive reasoning, we'll probably at some point in the future also admit that at least certain types of machine do have conscious state, that they are sentient, that it does feel like something to be such a machine. Now, surely it's going to feel like something, because the evolutionary history, the construction, the design, the architecture is radically different from our evolutionary history, design, and construction. But, but all I'm submitting, it's well possible that there will be machines that will, that it feels like something to be those machines. You, you mentioned both objective and subjective experiences. In your research, you do research with subjective experience, and if you do, how you distinguish that from objective? No, I mean, uh, any experience is subjective, right? I experience, anything we experience, there's an objective point of view. I can look at your brain, so you're seeing you're having, um, whatever, an experience, right? Pain, pleasure, you're seeing God, you're, you, you know, whatever. And, but, but there are two aspects to, to it. There's the subjective aspect that you, as an, an on observer experience something, whatever it is. And there's the objective aspect. I can see certain parts in your brain are active and some neurons are firing, some other neurons are not firing. And the, and the, the ancient mind-body problem involves trying to relate, the rela what is the, to elucidate the exact relationship between the subjective internal experience of that system with its um, external behavior. That's what a science of conscience tries to do. That's what philosophy tries to do. And now that's what scientists are trying to do. All right, pick another one. <laughs> this one has two questions, so I'm going to ask the first one. All right, so does consciousness exist with the individual or within a field in which the, let's see, entity exists? So as far as we can tell, it's, it's linked to individual brains, right? So, I mean, that's if you read poetry or you listen to songs about love, right, that's a problem. I don't, I can never know what anybody else is feeling. I can infer it by looking at their eyes, by relating their behavior, by listening to what they say, but we all know, think about the undercover spies, think about the person, the lover who has an affair, right? We, we know there are many cases when I don't truly know what the other one is thinking. That's the limitation of, that's what it is to be human. I can never really know what the other one is thinking. So I don't think there's sort of a field-like uh, field -like thingamajiggy that connects me with, with, with another one in anything but a metaphorical sense. That's not to say that in the fullness of time we cannot design machines that will directly enable my brain to can talk to your brain, right? If you think about a matrix-like technology, well, I, for example, you might know there are 200 million fibers called the corpus callosum that connect the left brain with the right brain. It may well be possible that at some point uh, there's a technology that allows me to connect my bri right brain, for example, with Sarah's left cortical hemisphere, in which case we would create something truly novel because it would now be sort of the juxtaposition or the combination of two, di of two hemispheres and would be a totally new, new conscious experience um, um, for us. But I, d I, d I don't think in, I don't believe in this field. It's too vague for me, a field of consciousness. We're going to go to the back room. You talked, of, you talked about uh, various stages of, or levels of consciousness, um, REM sleep, uh, awakening, and things like that. Is there any clear distinction between in the areas of the brain that are active so that you can really categorize one of these things as being totally distinct from another? Or do they tend to blend? Or so there's kind of states that are in between that you might describe as in between conscious states yes <laughs> <laughs> I mean who has here experienced do you guys know what lucid dreams are yes. all right well you probably had one all right so there are these dreams uh, you, it's rare but it does happen where people wake up while they 
while they sleep, while they're having a dream, and you can sort of control it to a certain extent, right? So you can now control your own dream. You can be the own director of your own movie and act out whatever, th whatever, you're, wh whatever you desire. So, as, so such a state represents sort of somewhere in between. You're not fully awake, but you're partial awake, and, and people are doing imaging now, trying to do brain imaging of these states to try to understand what, what, what happens, what part of the brain is suppressed and what part of not is suppressed. So like, there's not a, a, an, an all or none distinction, but they're strong. You can typically, from an EG, for example, certainly tell whether a person is in deep sleep or whether they're awake. It's much more difficult to tell from an EG whether you're dreaming in REM sleep or awake, because that's why REM sleep is also called paradoxical sleep, because in REM sleep, turns out, Parts of our brain are very active. Other parts are, however, shut down. Particular parts of prefrontal cortex are shut down in REM sleep, which explains some of the phenomenology of dreams. You don't have a lot of insight, right? You meet your long-dead grandmother or long-dead pet, or you fly, you walk through walls, and you don't find any of that surprising. That's because part of the brain that mediates self-consciousness, that would be surprised if I can suddenly take off and fly through the window here, you also would be surprised, um, <laughs> that part of the brain is, is effectively shut down. Okay, a lot of them. Okay, yeah. so what is your research goal? Is, conscious, is consciousness connected or related to the human soul? So there are two, so if you want to choose one. Wait, 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 so there are two questions there. How about we'll go with the first one since that's what I did last time. What is your research goal? Well, to try to understand. So I, I, I have this deep thirst. I, I want to know. I want to know things. I always wanted to know as a little boy also. And I want to know... Um, and partly it, it, it probably relates to, to my personal biography. I gr grew up as a devout Roman Catholic, um, but I'm a lapsed Roman Catholic. Now it relates to that. I, w I, w I want to know. I mean, conscience seems to be the most one, 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 one of the most fundamental aspects of the universe. Finally, you know, uh, you can think, uh, finally, the only way I know about the universe. This is the, the most famous deduction in Western philosophy. It's René Descartes, cogito ergo sum. You know, I, I, I am, there, or you can say I'm conscious, therefore I know I am. The only way I know about anything in the world, the only way I know even about objective facts is because I experience them. I can read, you know, the, f the flickering um, a meter on, an, on, a, on a current meter, right? Or I, I, I can see things. So the only way I know anything about the world is through conscious experience. And it, what's always bugged me that that's, uh, until, let's say, 20 years ago, when I started doing this research, scientists sort of carefully stayed away from consciousness because it was believed once you do consciousness, you can do that if you are a retired Nobel laureate like Francis Crick or Jerry Edelman and a few other cl professional class could do it. Like I noticed a lot of retired doctors, um, people send me, um, doctors send me manuscripts about, about their thoughts on consciousness, but by and large sort of serious academic scientists didn't do that. And I felt that was always really silly because if, since consciousness occupies such a central part in our existence, if science excludes this part because it, it, it believes it can't study it, that's really a um, a very large limitation, and I don't see any reason why science should not be able to explain this most fundamental aspect of, of our existence. And I'd like to understand where, where, does this, where does this fundamental part of our universe come from? Where does it originate? Which other creatures are conscious? Uh, thank you for the talk. It was wonderful. I uh, have a question, uh, and it kind of comes down from some understanding that was brought to me, Dr. Joanne Wick, he asked me to defend my imagination and asked others to do the same in her book, Imagination. Uh, in the Eastern philosophies, however, emptiness is sought, and um, that's done to, from my understanding, create an open space for thought. Uh, being a leader in the field of understanding of consciousness, what do you say is the best means of creating consciousness? You are conscious right now. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, you know, you are conscious right now, right? You, you have, you, you, you must feel happy or excited or sad or depressed or whatever, right? Well, that's a conscious state. I don't, I mean, people say they want to create an, an uber form of consciousness. I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, so the, the one thing, the only thing I can say, you know, having done meditation and also having done climbing, and I think they're similar, that you can, it, it might be possible to create a state where you're not conscious of any one specific content. I mean, certain forms of, of Zen, of Zazen med, uh, meditation, right, involves, involves this sort of form where you're trying to not focus of, on anything particular, but you're still, you're of course still trying to stay awake, otherwise you get struck by your teacher. And so you're not conscious of anything in particular, but you, you, you are still in a, in a, in a conscious state. I don't know, you know, when people talk about higher consciousness, I think it's a very, very metaphorical form of, 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 of usage. It's, 
I can't really relate that to sort of um, to the sort of consciousness um, I study. I mean, there's also political form, a political consciousness. There are all sorts of. I mean, consciousness is used in very, very broad form. I'm not sure how that relates to the to the subjective phenomenal experience that that I'm interested in. I just don't know. Card, sir. Would you agree with the idea that one day the scientists would be able to figure out a way to erase or overwrite the negative memories or consciousness from a person? Yeah, people are doing that right, uh, uh, right now already. Um, when p you know, when you can certainly do this in animals, when they have, let's say, mice or rats, when you give them aversive uh, conditioning, when you, let's say, you, the, 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 the mouse experiences, you know, hear six tones of beep, a high tone, and then gets shocked. So um, the next time it's in his cage, it, you just play the high tone beep. Um, it gets very nervous. It's anxious. It starts freezing. You can you can measure it by various measures of, of arousal. So there are now ways that that the people have done, and they're starting to do it in a pe in in humans, in patients with post-traumatic stress disorder. That it might be possible to very specifically, um, when you re-experience that, that that particular memory and you give certain drugs, you might be able to specifically erase that. Because one thing neuroscience has learned over the last 20 years, that very different from a computer. You know, when when you store something in a computer, you'll remember that forever. Right, we are very different. When I remember something, each time I recall it, I re-encode it. So it's not that I have this one memory, it's written in my RAM, and it's forever the same form. But when I have a memory, you know, any particular memory, every time I recall it, every time I say, you say, well, don't you remember when this and that happened, I re-encode it. So in other words, memories are, are um, our memories, are uh, different from computer's memory, are very flexible. And this allows, in principle, to devise procedures on patients that are greatly troubled by their, by their, you know, b because they had trauma, to specifically erase uh, those memories. So we're going to go to the back room. What are your thoughts on group psychology and a sense of personal responsibility? Is that clear enough? Uh, <laughs> that's a big. I don't know what to say. I mean. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know what to say to that. I mean, group psychology, yeah, yeah. No, I'd rather not comment. Okay. Uh, sorry, I don't really know what to say meaningful about that. All right, another card, sir. Oh, he's got to hydrate. Hold on. Need some beer after that. Does the discovery of the other, let's see, oh, the other brain have any impact on consciousness research? What do you mean by the other brain? See, I see a word here. I'm just trying to read handwriting. Glia brain. Yes. Yeah, it might. So, so we, um, neuroscience by and large focuses on one half of the brain that are actually made out of nerve cells, neurons. They're also supporting actors. They're so-called glia cells. They are sort of responsible for metabolism. They sweep up all the waste products that are generated by the electrical activity. And they're roughly as numerous. So we have in the humans uh, on the order of 100 billion cells, as many as suns as in, our, in the Milky Way galaxy. They're roughly 100 billion, um, at 10 to the 11 neurons. And they're roughly 10 to the 11, 100 billion glia cells. We understand much less about them, but we think they, behave, they seem to behave, respond much more sluggishly, much more s um, slowly. So. The, the speed of thought and the speed at which we can see and smell and move about is much, much faster. It's much closer match to the speed, the way neurons behave than the, than the way glia cells behave. So most of us think that the glia cells are probably not centrally involved in um, consciousness, although they're essential if you don't have them, if you, let's say, get a, a tumor there, so bad things will happen. But they're probably not directly involved in, in generating consciousness. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, how people uh, um, adopt habits and uh, a, a good friend of mine actually recommends that if you have a bad habit, you replace it with a good one. Um, I'd just like to know your comments on that. Yeah, I mean, we have this, I don't know, I mean, we have these habit-forming systems. They enable us to uh, survive, to learn basic skills, you know, um, uh, Moving about, um, 
particular you know, sensory motor skill in sports or in daily life, if we wouldn't have them, if you had to spend all your time just, so for example, you have many muscles that are just dedicated to moving your eyes. It's a very complicated system moving your eyes. If you had to, and you move your eyes roughly three to four times a day, you move your eyes as often as your heart beats. Um, if you had to constantly think about every time, okay, now I need to move here, then something is happening over there, then your entire conscience would be filled up just by moving your eyes. You still, of course, have to move your limbs and your legs. You have to walk and chew gum at the same time. And so, so what, what the brain has evolved, the system that, that, that you'd asked me about, so we, we, we learn these very early, some are inborn, and some we learn early on, and then we sort of down-compile them. Let's think about it, like we down-compile them, send them off to this basal ganglion that takes care of it, that frees up our mind to more important things, like planning long-term, you know, where do we want to go over the next 10 minutes, or, or, or things like that. Let's look at this one, yours. All right, I think we might have just answered this one a few questions ago, but what are your thoughts about the meaning or function of dreams? So I think meaning, so over the last century we've seen um, the pendulum swing radical on, or, on uh, in terms of interpretation of dreams. Of course, 110 years ago, Sigmund Freud rose to prominence and fame by publishing in 1900's book, Interpretation of Dreams, and of course he gave this account of dreams, this beautiful account, dreams are sort of the stage where the actors of our life, you know, lust and anger and hate and sex and the, all those things act out their stage and sort of they, they manifest themselves in these unconscious design, our dreams. Then in the 60s and 70s there was this belief, well, that's all baloney and dreams are purely random. They're just totally random. But now I think there's sort of an equilibrium where people think that dreams do incorporate elements of our lives you'll notice is, for example, when you obsess about something, like when there's a difficult climb that you can't do, you keep on failing on, you tend to dream about that. Or if you have a, any other sort of important event in your life over extending many days, at some point your brain will incorporate elements of that, of that event in, in, into your dream. So we do think that dreamings have a lot of random elements, but there's also day-to-day um, -day activation of events from, that day, from, that, uh, from, that, uh, from your current day or from the previous days that are mixed into. The function of it, we still don't know. The most popular speculation is that it helps us to, um, with memory, that if you don't dream, and people have done these experiments where they selectively try to disrupt REM dream and then show some interference with, um, with, uh, with memory. So the, one out of the most popular out of the current hypothesis why we dream is that it has to do with efficient memory organization. It's a hypothesis. There might be multiple uh, uh, functions of dreams. Okay, we're gonna go to the back room. Hi, um, I have a question. I'm not sure if you've answered this or not, but um, it's a question about the subconscious and subliminal messages. Like, have we had any hard science about, about giving people training in, you know, subliminally? Like, don't eat fattening things or even worse, you know, something sinister. I mean, does that even work or are, is it very, like, on a superficial level, like, you can just stop biting your nails? Or can you really change somebody's actions or direct people subliminally? Yes and no. So yes, it does work. You can show in a lab that I can show you, uh, I can show you a text, for instance, um, bank, right? What happens, I give you uh, over earphones the word bank, and I say it very, very softly. So if I ask you constantly, what did I say? And I mask it, I have noise, and then a, a, a very faint voice says bank. And I can ask you consciously, did you hear something? I said, yeah, but can you tell me the word? No. But then afterwards, for example, I can show, depending on whether I have a context river bank or money, you know, mana, a money bank, you, 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 um, you behave differently. So like, like your brain perceived it, but not consciously. And there, it's called priming, there are many effects like that. Um, but the effect is very weak and it, it goes away very, very quickly. So typically all these priming effects go away after a couple of seconds and typically they're weak. You know, they might be 55% versus 45% uh, um, where 50% is chance. So it's, um, it doesn't work. You can't make people do something and, you know, stop eating meat or do, you know, what, whatever else. It doesn't work that way. It, it, it can go into your conscious, but only very, it's a very, very weak signal. 
much better. What works all the time is television, right? Ads, right? We watch at them. We look at them. I mean, we know they work. Over the la in, in 2009, the last year for which I have number, the pl we on the pl planet face spent $100 billion in advertising. Advertising works. It's, well, you know, you put out an ad there of whatever for, for you know, a commercial for a car or a piece of clothes or whatever, and people, there are all sorts of un effects we understand that you look at them, your brain pauses it, you might not pay a lot of attention, but your brain pauses it, and that will influence your behavior. You will go out, and then you're more likely to buy one, you know, whatever the car is that, uh, that's being advertised. So uh, this, uh, this uh, subliminal is sort of vastly overplayed and hyped. It's a, it's a very weak effect, but sort of people are traumatized uh, uh, by it because they think, you know, so they have these, these um, uh, non-conscious commands. But much more important, we know it works, is propaganda and, and commercial advertising. Uh, so earlier in your presentation, you mentioned about um, philosophers have um, debated whether um, language is a requirement for consciousness. And um, I was wondering if, firstly, if um, that debate had to do with uh, whether thoughts preceded language, and what, you know, or vice versa. And secondly, I wanted to ask, what are some uh, examples of um, studies and experiments that have availed us um, evidence for the claim that um, language is not required for consciousness? Well, the, 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 the fact is that if you take a person who's never mute deaf, somebody who's never had language, and of course he's still a human, he's still all the capacity for, for, for human thought, um, his behavior, his or her behavioral repertoire and the conscious experience seems to be very similar. He can't directly talk to you about it, but he seems to have the same, for example, if I test him in the lab, the same response. Same thing if you take a, a patient who has a stroke and who can't talk anymore, he seems to have the same behavioral repertoire, for example, in terms of vision. Um, also, if you look at um, young infants, uh, young children, you know, being, you know, say half a year, a year old who can't really talk. Of course, they don't. It, that's not to say, I don't want to say that language doesn't enrich our experience. There's no question about it. It makes possible, you know, civilized life. But basic experience of pain, of pleasure, of being happy, of being sad, they seem to precede. A, we can see analogs in non linguistic competent um, animals, in, in chimps or in monkeys or in dogs. That, that don't have capacity of language, and also in us, they don't seem to de depend on language. You can also do functional brain imaging experiments where, you, where, where, where people don't talk, but you can see when they have conscious experiences, say of pa pain or pleasure or happy, the same parts of the brain light up whether or not they, they, and they speak about it. So, so la language, it enriches our experience, it's the basis of, of culture and human civilization, but it doesn't seem to be the, the basis for why we have um, uh, uh, conscious experiences. If you look at an atom, a, n uh, a proton or a, uh, uh, a neutron, they have of course nonlinear interaction, uh, you know, the, uh, that the quarks that make up the, uh, the particle. So it's well possible that one idea says a threshold, you need a complexity of certain order to experience. The more elegant theory of course is, is still panpsychism, that there's no threshold whatsoever, it's just a gradual property just like many other properties in, um, in, um, in the world, and that any system that has some sort of particular type of complexity will have conscious experience. Now, that's th it might well be possible that the conscious experience of something like a gnat or this worm I showed before is so infinitesimal small that for all practical intent purposes, it's not conscious. Uh, we just don't know right now. I mean, we tend to assume, we have these very strong biases. We tend to assume consciousness is in us, only us, or some people are willing to grant it to our favorite pets, like dogs and cats and maybe monkeys, but to nobody else. But of course, we have these very strong anthropocentric views. You know, for the longest, we thought we're the only relevant species. We thought we're the center of the universe, and then we discovered slowly that's not quite the case. So right now, it's, a, it's really an, it's an open question. We don't know. We, we don't know whether panpsychism uh, pan is true or not. But, uh, but the, the, in the important point is it's something that we can begin to think about rationally. Uh, no, philosophers also thought about it rationally, but the important point is we can begin to do something about it. We can investigate this empirically, and at some point we can build artifacts and, and you know, test our theories to, to see to what extent are these artifacts conscious. And that's really something that only happened over the last 10 or 20 years. <coughs> I'm not a scientist, by the way, but I'm very interested in what you have to say. And uh, I've been attending a lot of workshops having to do with consciousness and changing your mind and changing your chemistry and so forth. And one of the examples that is always mentioned is that in a person with multiple personalities, one alter is a diabetic and the others aren't. 
and that the diabetes is manifested mm -hmm. in that one altar. <coughs> so what do you have to say about the, the, ef the effect or the influence of thinking on the chemistry of the body? And the ability to well, so it. in these uh, multiple personality disorder, uh, now it's called identity dissociation disorder, there seem to be some sort of compartmentalization of certain aspects of, of conscious sensation. So the claim is, you know, very often these um, um, people, usually women who've been t t uh, horribly sexual or physically or emotional or sometimes all three abused when they were a child, and so to to protect them from that, they sort of learn to compartmentalize and sort of to have certain memories. I know one scientific study case which I found completely implausible until I looked into it. So in one case, there's, an, there's a proven experimental record where you have one lady who in a normal state was blind and then you could evoke this alternate personality was a, a man, a young man, by calling her up. Uh, she got into this one, she got very anxious or you, you evoked it by, by calling up a name and then she, um, um, Sorry, it was the other way around. In normal state, she was sighted. In this state, she was blind. And you can do objective tests. For example, you can show lights into her eyes, and you can try to record it. And indeed, indeed it was true in her blind state, the, her visual brain at the back of the brain did not register the incoming sign, although the signal, although the brain, uh, the eyes were open. So what that tells me, it's exceedingly interesting. It tells me, as scientists, that due to her massive traumatic experience, somehow the brain is organized quite differently in, in these in unfortunate um, individuals. And compared to you and me, because if I have my eyes open and you shine a light in me, I will see something. I cannot not see. I mean, it's just no way to put a gun to my head. I cannot not see the open light when my, when the light when my eyes are open, but she somehow could. So it tells us, you know, the brain is plastic, and in these people it seems to be very plastic early on in, in childhood. I find it exceedingly interesting. Um, what, what it may tell us about the compartmentalization of co conscious under very traumatic conditions. So the question is to what extent, well, what does it mean for, for and for a person who did not grow up under these horrible circumstances, and that we don't know. Okay, thank you, Christoph. Thank you much. Great.